Okay. Uh, any questions you may have after this presentation? Uh, well, I mean, of course, talk during the presentation, but even if you think of something tomorrow, uh, go ahead and uh, just send me an email. Uh, or if you have a picture of a cloud or you, you just want to discuss more about weather, because uh, I'm learning more about your uh, unique operations as well and your criteria. Um, I did read uh, your standard practices for parasailing just to give me an idea of what you have to look out for. And that's what this presentation is about. First off, uh, I work for the federal government uh, under the Department of Commerce, and then there's NOAA. There's NOAA Fisheries, NOAA Ocean Service. We are the Weather Service. Under the Weather Service, you've heard probably of some national centers like the Hurricane Center. They paint the big picture of what's going to happen in your area. And it's your local Weather Service forecast office that paints all the small scale details. And of course, this is how it works in the US. Um, and here is the, the different stations across the country. Uh, my last station was Bismarck, North Dakota, 20 years ago, where it got down to 46 below, and we left. And now we've been here, and we're never leaving Florida. Um, so each local office, and all disasters are local, and that's why we have a local office and local contacts, uh, so we can communicate better. Uh, so we issue the weather warnings that you hear or see on radio and television. It's not the uh, the TV meteorologists, but we rely on them to communicate that message. So the way the warning system works in our country is the National Weather Service. We are the foundation of America's weather services with you know satellites, radars, modeling data. And then our mission is to interpret the forecast for decision makers in emergency management and public officials, the ones that spend money to protect life and property. Uh, and that's our main job. We do not have an app, a weather app. That's the private sector's responsibility. And uh, especially the local media, they're the ones that you wanna to tune to if something's coming toward your area because they have the information from the weather service and from local emergency management. So they have more of a complete picture than say a national outlet. Now let's talk about advances in technology. It's very exciting time to be around. Uh, from the 80s, we look at that Radio Shack ad on the left, and I spent a lot of time at Radio Shack. And all of those things on this flyer can be done with a single smartphone now, and that was as of 2007. So, uh, you know, in roughly 25 years, we went from the left to the right, and that, that's pretty fast. And we also did that with supercomputers and forecasting. The rate of change in weather forecasting is faster than it's ever been, and it's a very exciting time. Uh, this is what our National Weather Service supercomputer looks like. That's what half of it looks like. The other half is in Orlando, and one half is in uh, Silver Spring, Maryland. And we had to learn a new term called a petaflop. It's a quadrillion or a thousand trillion floating operations per second. And if you look in 2005, uh, when we had Hurricane Katrina, we didn't have much computer power back then. Uh, we could pretty much run the forecast model once, and then that was it. Uh, now, in 2013, the Sony PlayStation 4 came out, and the graphical processing unit, and you can see the speed of that. So two of those Sony PlayStations 4 had as much power as the supercomputer did in the National Weather Service in 2005. That's how fast technology is changing. Uh, 2014, we got an upgrade. Still wasn't good enough. In 2018, we got a major upgrade after Hurricane Sandy. Uh, FEMA gave us money to harden weather service offices and to buy a new supercomputer uh, that is uh, more competitive with other countries like the European, the UK model, and such. Um, however, in 2018, the US Department of Energy had a 180 petaflop computer to do, I suspect, simulations of nuclear explosions, things like that. Um, and now that's five years ago. Imagine what we have today. So why do we need all this computer power? We divide the Earth's atmosphere into cubes. So it's a three-dimensional cube all around the globe. And the smaller we can make those cubes, uh, the better in most cases. And if we just look at this one 3D grid box, the blue one, we can use math to solve what the weather is like inside that box. 
And then we say, okay, two minutes from now, how is that weather changing? Well, that's what math does. And then we do that out of all these little boxes around the country uh, and around the world. And we can come up with these simulations. This one happens to be wind speed with Hurricane Ivan in 2004 or five, four. And the colors are, and the, you know, the purples are hurricane force winds and the greens are tropical storm force winds. But that's where it was forecasting Ivan to go. And they look really nice. And I'm sure all of you, or many of you use computer simulations and the data looks really good. It looks real, but be cautious. Uh, tools like Windy and uh, Vendusky, uh, they are using model data, I believe, to create those wind fields. And uh, it looks really good, but it can be wrong. So just keep that in mind. Now, if you want an hour by hour forecast, uh, weather.gov slash forecast points. And then you can see I click down here by Tampa, that white dot. You can zoom in to your area and then click change domain and then bookmark. And it will show you radar data, warnings, and then also the forecast for where you clicked. Now, when you uh, click and you zoom down, you can get a, a text forecast, you know, a table of uh, weather parameters, but this, I like the graph, uh, especially the bottom one, the wave height is the last graph on that page. And you can get a quick seven day uh, forecast of wave heights just to kind of give you an extended forecast for your operations. I have to talk about major hurricane Ian that hit just before your symposium in Sarasota. Uh, it was the fifth strongest hurricane ever to hit the United States. Uh, unfortunately, we had 139 fatalities in Florida, most of them in the Fort Myers area. Uh, Cat 4 made landfall the same place as Hurricane Charlie did in 2004, but this was a much bigger storm, much bigger impacts. You can see the wind field here uh, was pretty wide as it went from Fort Myers up to Daytona Beach across the state. Uh, we had weather instruments that surprisingly didn't fail. Uh, we had a Cape Coral Yacht Club had a weather flow device 140 miles an hour. And uh, it, uh, it was a lot of wind. But surprisingly, uh, the wind wasn't the big story. It was the storm surge and the flooding. Now, what would you do in this case? Let's say you are a parasailing operator in Fort Myers Beach. It's 5 p.m. Monday. This is a forecast from the Hurricane Center. And that cone of uncertainty just is touching Fort Myers Beach. And somewhere along the west coast of Florida, are gonna have a surge on Wednesday. So what are you gonna do? Um, well, the emergency management is already gonna be calling for uh, evacuations and probably shutting down the hotels on the beach. Um, but the problem they have is if you look at the colors, it goes from the Big Bend area of Florida all the way down to the Florida Keys. That's over 300, 400 miles of coastline under the threat. But we knew only 20 or 30 miles was going to have the worst of the surge. Um, so do you evacuate everybody? That's a lot of people. Um, so if you look at the track of Ian, uh, Fort Myers is down here where all the colors are. That's the storm surge. The red is everywhere with over nine feet of water above ground. And it went, you know, 15 miles inland. Um, all the barrier islands were over top with six to 10 feet of water. And uh, north of the eye wall up in Sarasota and Tampa Bay, tides were four to seven feet below normal. And then the rain actually can impact parasailing. You go, well, how can that be? I mean, you're not going to parasail when it's rain because your parachute's going to get heavy. But look at this dark area of rain here just north of Charlotte Harbor. Uh, the peak was 27 inches. Um, can you imagine getting 27 inches of rain in two days? And the reason I bring it up is this is the alga bloom, the red tide that occurred with all the runoff and it went down the coast. Um, so if you had parasailing operations, uh, you would be dealing with red tide uh, and it's still going on uh, today. So here are the impacts you got. Homes and businesses are washed off their foundations, roads destroyed, water up to the you know, rooftops. Uh, and then you had river flooding, uh, isolating uh, towns like Arcadia. 
Um, these are the impacts. Now, are you prepared for your business if a major storm comes? And we're just going to briefly talk about this. Uh, Ready.gov has a great place to build uh, a business plan and a kit and to help keep your employees safe as well. So they're more likely to come back after an event. All right, with that, um, you're on the water, you're gonna start off for the day. There are gonna be storms later in the day. You need to be able to get uh, weather warnings and messages. Uh, we don't have an app, but there's a lot of wonderful commercial apps from local media and also just other wonderful weather apps out there. Uh, the FEMA app is a great app, especially if you have damage to your business, uh, you can click on disaster resources and it'll tell you which forms to fill out and where to bring them. Um, and then of course, uh, weather radio is a nice low tech way to get weather information uh, and is great to have on board. The only unfortunate thing with weather radios is our marine zones are pretty big. So if we did one for 20 miles away from your business, it still might turn on your radio and you would have to listen to see where exactly that storm is. So again, these warn of not only of natural, but also man-made hazards. So if there is a civil emergency message from emergency management, they want you to evacuate for some reason, these go off for those as well. Now, hopefully all of you look at radar apps. That's a great tool for your industry. And there's many different versions out there some are cleaned up and look pretty, but if, uh, if you can, I suggest get the ones that look dirty because they have the, all the data in there. Um, before we look at some radar data, let's look at thunderstorms. And look, you know, there's gonna be two parts. You're gonna have a flat cloud base, that's the updraft. And that's where the air is being vacuumed up into the storm tower, generating rain, and then that falls on the other side of the storm and that's your downdraft. So first you wanna do is any storm, you know, look at the updrafts and downdrafts. So this is a little fella um, and just a single storm. Um, now the downdraft characteristics, anytime you see rain fall into the ground, that's a downdraft. And a rain foot is where the rain starts to push horizontally along the ground because the wind is strong. And that is an indication of a strong wind in that area. And then of course, you've got the updraft. So in, a helpful analogy would be the, when the storm is inhaling, you'll get the updraft rain-free base, inflow, wall cloud, funnel cloud, tornadoes, and water shots. Everything else is in the downdraft. When it's exhaling, that's when you get the you get damaging downburst winds, the rain, um, the cold outflow that could race ahead of the storm, and of course shelf and roll clouds, which we'll look at. So let's look at this uh, shelf cloud, and the cold air is moving from left to right on this gust front, and the warm air is lighter than cold air, not as many atoms, and so it gets. Kind of pushed up or shoveled up the cold air and then that's what creates this weird looking cloud now as that air well this is what it looked like um and it looked like a tornado it was reported as a tornado but it wasn't spinning and we had no rotation on radar this is another view of that same storm or same line of clouds this is a roll cloud the cold air is on one side warm air is on the other and the warm air is being forced up and over and it's causing that cloud to form and what happened is the cold air from the thunderstorm is moving faster than the thunderstorm itself. So the cloud detached itself. And it's these kind of boundaries that you want to be on the lookout for because they can race out ahead of the storms. Uh, you might say, hey, that storm's 40 miles out, but well, this boundary is only 10 miles out and it's headed toward you. And that can cause rapid changes in wind direction and speed. So here is a satellite, I'm sorry, a radar. And you can see this arcing blue cloud headed toward the coast out ahead of this line of storms. And that is a gust front. Um, and it produced 40 mile an hour winds or 34 knot winds on Indian Rocks Beach. And it can catch a parasailing operator uh, off guard because the storms, they were out further than that. You know, they're out 30 miles and you're thinking, okay, we can do another run, makes sense to me. And then 
now when it's 13 miles offshore, the winds at Indian Rocks Beach are already 40 miles an hour. And so it's those boundaries you want to, to keep an eye on or have somebody keep an eye on. And the wind is going to change before that boundary arrives at your location, uh, just before. So why, you know, what causes weather? What is going on? And really it's temperature combined with moisture differences. Uh, cold air is heavier because it has more molecules than warm air. So when the heating starts up in the morning, the air over the ocean is going to heat up much slower than the air over the land because the sunshine is going into the water and heating up some of that water uh, at different depths. Whereas the land, the sun can't go through dirt. So it heats up and the radiation increases, creates long wave radiation and heat. And what that does is it ends up with a sea breeze circulation and that's where the low pressure starts interior or over land and the warm air rises. The cooler marine air has to move inland to replace the air that's going up. And then so you get this circulation, the sea breeze circulation that forms. And that blue line is the leading edge of the cool air moving inland. And that is a boundary which storms can form on. And then at night, it's uh, reversed. All the air that was going up over the land uh, doesn't have the sun to produce the updrafts anymore. So all those updrafts collapse. And then right at in the evening, right before sunset, you get this rush of cold air at the coast. And those are the updrafts collapsing and the land breeze is pushing out into, in this case, the Gulf of Mexico. So let's put all that together. You got a visible satellite image of Florida. You can see some land areas. Why is that? Because the Gulf Coast sea breeze front has moved inland. There's cold air on the left side, warm air on the right side. Same thing happened on the Atlantic coast. Cold air is on the right side. Now the warm air is on the left side. And now if you can see the different lakes, you can see clear air there too. And Lake Okeechobee is a big lake. The cool air over the lake that morning is drifting to the Southwest toward Naples. And when these two boundaries collide, we would be looking for possible storm development uh, later. So we want to look for colliding boundaries. What's going on here along Interstate 4 from Tampa to Orlando? Uh, those are showers and thunderstorms that started out in Tampa and then started drifting toward Lakeland and Orlando. Um, even though there's no boundary out here, the storms actually started over Tampa and then moved away. So let's look on a local scale because this is probably the scale you're interested in. And there's a lot going on, especially if you're parasailing near a bay. Uh, so we got heating from the sun, uh, warm air, cool air comes inland. We also have bay breezes. There is cooler over there and the bay breeze is moving inland uh, over on the east side as well. And so these are boundaries that can start uh, more storms especially colliding boundaries in this county, Pinellas County. Uh, when these two boundaries collide, we often see the first shower of the day form over this county. So let's go back to computer simulations. And you can see these beautiful high resolution models. And it, it's not going to be actually perfect, but it does give you a really good idea what's going to happen. And here we have the sea breeze is stuck along the coast in Fort Myers, and it's a little bit more inland in Tampa Bay. And the winds are this direction in the warm, humid air. And in the cool marine air, the winds are that direction. And then you can see something going on in the Gulf. That's sinking air. So whenever air is moving away from each other, that's sinking high pressure in that location. So it gives you a real good idea. Um, and then if you went and stepped forward, you could see, okay, do we expect the sea breeze to light up with storms and then push outward over the water and end my day early for operations? Um, that's kind of the things the forecast can, can show you. Um, real briefly, we're gonna put it all together with this animation. South Florida, you can see the clouds are starting to form. Then you'll see the big white blotch near Miami. That's a thunderstorm. It drops out a big cold outflow boundary and you'll see this arcing line of white clouds moving away from the thunderstorm. There's cold air behind it and it hits an existing thunderstorm and look how bubbly it gets up on top. 
anytime you have a boundary colliding with an existing thunderstorm, it's a good chance that that storm is going to go severe. And this is the radar dish inside the dome. The Weather Service has, uh, uh, and combined with the FAA and the Department of, of Defense, I think have over 130 of these across the country. And the dish, what makes this special is the dish is three stories high. You really want a big dish. Most TV station dishes are 12 feet. The newer ones are 17 feet. This one is 28 feet. And the best data is going to be 20 to 60 miles from the radar. So if your operations are within that distance from a radar, congratulations, you've got the best data. You can see here, I'm looking at a thunderstorm across the bay from my office. And this is what it looked like on radar. It chopped the top off. Why is that? We only scan up to 19 degrees and then we start over again. We're trying to balance uh, not taking too long to scan versus getting more frequent updates. And so you don't want to be too close. So we don't actually use our radar to put out warnings for Ruskin. We use Melbourne's radar. Here's what a line of storms look like when it comes over the radar. This is at 19 degrees elevation, this top one here. And you can see it kind of looks like a bowl um, or a stadium. And you can kind of see the stair stepping of the beam as it goes outward away from the radar. Let's look at this. What is the radar detecting here? Well, it looks like a big area of light rain. Um, and there might be some sprinkles in there, but we're gonna look at this cross section from Naples to toward Key West or toward the Keys. And so left to right, you can see that the size of the beam. We have two beams that this cross section can uh, captured. And if we go to the very end, the beam center is 20,800 feet above the ground, and it's over a mile wide. So what does that tell you? The farther away you get from the radar, the blurrier the picture is going to be because the beam is wider. And also the earth is curving away from the beam. So the beam is gonna be higher above the ground here than it is here. Um, so, there are some cases where your sea breeze is gonna be pinned near the coast just due to prevailing winds are too strong and the sea breeze will just sit there and it'll wait in Florida's case for the Atlantic coast sea breeze to come by and hit it. And then you'll see uh, what we call uh, as the storm zipper up from south to north in this case. And so here we had nothing. And then all of a sudden, uh, if you're in clear water doing parasailing, Hey, it was clear like an hour ago, and now there's storms everywhere. Um, if you're looking at radar and seeing, oh, these two boundaries are going to collide, we might have storms later. Uh, that can help you anticipate those storms. Here is another colliding boundaries. Um, this is why you want to have the cleaned up version of the radar, because all this messy stuff in the light blues, that's normally filtered out. But you, they show the uh, boundaries the best. So if you don't have a radar that shows these type of boundaries, uh, definitely consider one. And I, I can't tell you which one to get because I can't promote one over another. Uh, with storms, you have lightning and uh, lightning density in Florida. You can see downtown Tampa and then uh, between Orlando and Daytona Beach has the most uh, lightning. And we use this map for years. And uh, it turns out some of the recent studies are showing uh, the peak lightning activity is actually down here by Fort Myers to Lake Okeechobee. But regardless, you know, Florida, we have over a million lightning strikes a year and 23 in the U.S. Uh, lightning is a problem for outdoor activities. We are not the lightning capital of the world, however, that people say. That goes to Lake Maracaibo in Venezuela. They get over uh, 297 days with thunderstorms per year, it's almost every single day. And that's because the sea breeze is pushing up the mountains. And actually this is Lake Maracaibo, I think up here. But let's look at lightning fatalities by gender. They're mostly male, and that could be because uh, most outdoor jobs are you know, mostly male dominated. Um, but also if you look at by gender, you can see that it's males in their twenties that are most at risk and they are doing water-related activities 35% of the time. So that's one in three fatalities are water-related. Um, 
So that means not only do you have to worry about gust fronts moving out ahead of the storms and impacting the wind direction on your sail, now you got to worry about lightning and that can easily strike six to 10 miles out ahead of the storm. And I think the Tampa airport, if it's within 10 miles, they shut down operations at the airport and everybody goes inside and they wait 30 minutes after the last strike before they resume. Um, and then that's a pretty good bet. Um, you can see this lightning strike at a football game and it just uh, captured it at the right time. Notice the lightning did not hit the uh, towel, the tall pole. It hit the tree, which is lower than the pole. Isn't lightning supposed to hit the tallest object? Lightning is lazy. It's going to do whatever is the easiest thing to do. And in this case, it was this shorter tree. Now, when this happened, all the football players ran off the field and sought shelter. But the band with their big brass instruments kept playing and they did not leave. So this is one of those cases where the football players were much smarter than the band. And the NFL and the NCAA have been taking lightning much more seriously. You're seeing games being delayed uh, more and more often. And I think people are a little bit more understanding. You say, hey, we can't fly. There's a storm nearby. We have to worry about lightning. Okay, with that, um, I think, does anybody have any questions so far before we move into the how the storms form? Not seeing any. So when you go outside, uh, the next time you see a storm developing, it's gonna happen in three stages and you'll first see the tower start to build upward. That's the towering cumulus stage. Cumulus is Latin for pile. So you get this towering pile or a clump of clouds. And then it begins to grow and the rain begins. Now you're in the mature stage. Then it rains itself out. Now you're in the dissipation stage. That takes about 30 to 40 minutes. We know storms last longer than 30 to 40 minutes. What's going on? Well, that's where you have multiple storms glued together, each one at a different uh, stage of the thunderstorm life cycle. And this is the first stage, the towering pile stage. So you got this rising currents of air, uh, the updraft uh, cools until the moisture inside the updraft condenses into visible cloud material. And as the towering cumulus begins to grow, now you're holding up rain-sized particles, which are much bigger than cloud-sized particles inside the cloud. And as the cloud continues to grow in about 10, 15 minutes, you get to the mature stage. And now this is where you have a cell and you know you have the air flowing into this thunderstorm cell creating the rain and it's falling out of a different part of the storm dropping the rain so you have your updraft and downdraft and why doesn't the updraft just keep going up into outer space it's again you just have to measure the temperature as long as the temperature inside the uh, tower of this cloud is warmer than the temperature outside the tower that tower will continue to rise when you get up here near the stratosphere, the air inside the cloud is becoming colder than the air outside of the cloud. And so now it's heavier and it can't go up any higher. So now all this rain is falling underneath the cloud and all this cold air is piling up underneath the thunderstorm. Cold air is heavy and it's going to start to move to the right. And now it's going to be out ahead of the storm and it's going to cut off any more inflow into the storm. Any more energy into the storm has to be cut off and the storm is going to rain itself out into the dissipation stage. And the cloud bases just go up and up and up and the rain just gets lighter and lighter and lighter. And the top of the anvil cloud becomes thin and wispy. You wouldn't have to really worry about anything from this. So let's look at that in 3D. And uh, this is from our radar here in Tampa Bay. We are seeing the towering cumulus. We're detecting rain-sized particles a lot. We are not detecting the cloud. The cloud-sized particles are way too small. But the green in this image, those are larger raindrops than the blue. And as the towering cumulus continues to grow, now we're up to around 50,000 feet. And now we've got some yellow in there. Um, the yellow and the red lines on this 3D image, that's the preferred hail growth region. And that's where we typically see the higher reflectivity is this yellow area because you might have some water-coated hail. 
And now we have entered the mature stage. Notice you can't see the bottom because the earth is curving away from the beam. Um, but we do see this water balloon in the sky, this red area, and that's what we're tracking. We're seeing how is this red area falling to the ground? Is it falling fast? Is it a preferred day for it to fall fast and cause downburst wind damage? Um, let's track it. And if we go to the next image, you can see it's plummeting to the ground. And now we're entering the dissipation stage and it's just starting to rain itself out and it goes away. We're going to look at this animation here in a second, but the next time it rains, when a storm comes over you, just think of this. One inch of rain over one square mile is not a big thunderstorm. It's 17 million gallons of water, 145 million pounds being held up by the updraft. And if the updraft stops quickly for some reason, all that weight of water comes crashing to the ground and can cause damage. So here is a rain draft. I'm sorry, a downdraft and rain shaft. And okay, not so bad here. Wherever there's rain, there's a downdraft. Here, we don't see any rain. Uh, this might be an updraft here. Um, and look at the edge. Do you see the rain being blown horizontally away from the main downdraft? If you do, there could be some stronger winds there and you might wanna get in a little early. Here's another one, non-severe, uh, because winds are only 35 miles an hour, but if that was you parasailing in that area, uh, that could cause a problem. And, if, and of course, these storms are the ones that are right on top of you. You wouldn't be out there anyway. Um, these are microbursts or small scale downbursts. It actually looks like a water balloon falling out of the sky. It hits the ground, it compresses, and that's what causes the rain foot to develop as that rain is horizontally blown away from the downdraft. So those are visual clues to look for to see if, hey, is that storm a little stronger than other ones? And on this video, you can kind of see that microburst and the clouds that it forms. So that cold air, you know, there's no rain in it, but the air is cold and you can see it lift up the air ahead of it and it's forming those little low-lying clouds under the thunderstorm base. So that is an indication to you that there are some strong winds out over the water. What mostly you're going to see are shelf clouds, and uh, even from a distance, especially if you're on the water, you can see them for you know over 10 miles away. This storm is moving left to right across the slot. You're standing where the W is, the warm, humid air, and all the wind is at your back, blowing into the storm, and the cold air in purple is lifting up this warm, humid air, causing this shelf cloud to develop at a lower level than the thunderstorm base. This is what that cloud looks like. Here we're looking north. The storm is moving left to right across the screen. This low hanging cloud is the shelf cloud. This cloud base above it is the thunderstorm base. This shelf cloud is forming because the cold air behind it is lifting up the warm air ahead of it. And just before this cloud comes overhead, your wind direction will change 180 degrees. Your temperature might drop 15, 20 degrees and winds could increase to over 40 miles an hour. This is a little shelf cloud over Lake Okeechobee coming toward the observer. Again, the cold air and rain is behind it as it approaches you. Here's a funny looking one uh, over land. Anytime you see a funny looking long cloud with rain behind it and it's approaching you, it's some kind of a shelf cloud with a downdraft behind it. And here's a big one headed offshore. Uh, this one you could see on radar way ahead of time. It would have given you a heads up that this boundary was moving offshore. This is what it looked like physically. We got a lot of tornado reports. Uh, we had a few trees down. They said it was tornado damage when, in fact, it was actually a downburst wind. And it was because of these low-hanging scud clouds. People see a low-hanging cloud. The tree fell down. It had to be a tornado. When, in fact, downburst winds cover much larger areas and can be more impactful to parasailing than tornadoes because your chance of getting hit by a tornado are really small. Uh, chance of being impacted by a downburst wind is gonna happen. It's just gonna happen. Um, when the storms start firing and you're just looking, uh, look for the strongest storm. And you can tell that by looking at the updraft tower, if it has a hard crisp outline to the clouds with a cauliflower appearance, that's a strong updraft as opposed to the one on the right 
that's kind of soft and mushy silver lining and that's a weaker updraft. Um, so the one on the left, you'd be concerned about, oh yeah, strong updraft, probably gonna be some lightning and stronger downdrafts in that one on the left, as opposed to the one on the right. Now, if you wanna know more about weather, this is just a brief basic summary. We have two free online trainings. One is the Spotter Network. It's a nonprofit group, including weather service, storm chasers, media, academia. Um, and it works with smart device apps. MetEd is meteorological education. There are over 800 weather trainings and a lot of marine trainings, and they're all free. And they're developed by all the different universities across the country. You have to make an account in each, but both are free. Um, let's see where I go next here. Here's something else you can do to help uh, keep your employees prepared before uh, big events or even smaller events. Uh, we're looking for people to become ambassadors. And what you do is you go to weather.gov slash WRN for Weather Ready Nation. And you get an email about once a month with some resources to help you prepare your employees for hazardous weather. And one thing might be a simple, here's a simple, two-page family emergency plan if a hurricane approaches. If you encourage your employees to fill that out and keep a copy off-site somewhere like the family in Minnesota, uh, that's more than most people have. And that's awesome. And that's the, the whole gist of this. And some example of these ambassador resources, here's a, a boating safety tips and resources. Um, you can get infographics, you can put on your employee bulletin boards. If you have a website presence, you can do the, you know, wear your life vest things. Uh, uh, marine portals for quick access to weather data. Uh, there are some really good weather portals, marine portals in there. Check those out. And with that, I, that that's it for me. Does anybody uh, have any questions? James, I'll let you cover that. Yeah, thank you, Dan. So uh, like you said, if anybody has any questions, feel free to unmute yourself and uh, holler them out. No takers. Okay, uh, Dan, we really appreciate you being here. Uh, so yeah, see a few unmute. Absolutely, and I, I'm, I apologize that those hurricanes got in the way before, uh, but if you have an interesting weather case uh, when you're, doing your operations and you want me to investigate it a little further, I can do that and present it next year if I'm invited back to the symposium. So I'm trying to make it more relevant examples for everyone. I have, I have, I have one question. Yes. The, uh, so when you're talking about a shelf cloud, how, when you visually see it, approximately how many miles or how, how long is the distance or time-wise before you're gonna hit, get hit with that kind of wind. So this is where you need a radar app because all storms move at different speeds and their gust fronts move at different speeds and they form at different heights. So the higher it forms, the farther away you can see it. If it forms very low to the ground after six miles, you're probably not gonna see it over the water. Um, so I would not try to do it visually. I would use a radar app, to track that boundary and get a feel for when that boundary is going to impact your operations. Gotcha. Okay. And on a Garmin, if we have, well, if we have um, radar on our boats, as far as like a, a weather, we have a uh, master Mariner with XM. Is that, is that going to show you anything or no? Let's see. I have XM radar in my vehicle and it's not very good. Right. Uh, you, you really want the, updated high resolution stuff that you can get with your cell phone. Um, and since you're close enough to the shore, you should be able to get cell phone coverage. I, I would go with that more than some of the other ones, but I, I'll be honest, I have not seen the XM radar stuff on, for the Marine. Right. Okay. That's it. That's what I had for you. Excellent. Hey, right. Dan, can you hear me? Yes. Yep. Hey, Sean Bond of Myrtle Beach. Um, Currently, we're using radar scope as our best tool. Is that still recommended that uh, we stick with that? Well, we can't recommend anything since we're government, but I know a lot of meteorologists who use that app in particular. And then if you want other things like wind information, um, 
other ones are, if you just search for radar, you'll see things like Omega and, but those are pricier. Um, they're like 120 bucks a year where radar scope is free after you buy it for 10 bucks. So it depends what you need. All right, thank you. But we're safe still use. I mean, you're familiar with that one and that's still- uh... Oh, that one is good. It'll show you every product we have. And um, if you ever have a question on how to interpret something, you know, uh, I can point you to an online training class or you can just get a hold of me and we'll talk about it. And then one more on that, you were saying uh, that 20 to 60 mile range. So we're in between Wilmington and Charleston. Um, I'm not sure exactly where those, those uh, radars are, but we're out, we're around that 60 miles. So that's still pretty good in terms of what you're saying. Absolutely. I mean, some of the bigger outflow boundaries we can see in Fort Myers, just not that often because our beam is about 8,000 feet above the ground. And those boundaries don't typically, unless it's producing a thunderstorm, they don't show up. Um, so you really, you want to be unfortunately 20 to 60 miles away. From the radar for that all right sounds good thank you hey dan just to follow up, i think on something joel was saying there um is your is there a a distance that wind can be in front of a a shelf cloud that is like a common distance away so like if someone sees one that what well, they would expect the wind to arrive so if you can see a shelf cloud, it's probably coming toward you and you should probably get off the water. Yeah, uh, and that's absolutely. in general, but otherwise I would use the radar app to see where it's really going. Okay, but more is the case if they are trying to get down, but obviously, yeah, yeah it's moving nothing towards else, you. The wind is going to increase and change direct, direction uh, in a, you know, over a minute. It's going to happen quickly. Okay. Anybody else with questions? All right, I think that, oh, one more. Um, no, I'm good. Okay. Lee, Lee kind of okay. redirected the question again. Uh, not much. So, yeah. How you been? Okay. Uh, James, James has a PDF of this presentation. Yeah. I believe he'll be sending out. Um, I will. We'll have that and a uh, recording of this will be provided oh, right. um, yes. after the fact. So, uh, so yeah, yeah. So for any, for anybody who's on, um, uh, yeah, you can spread the word if you like that soon. We'll be posting a recording of this for others to watch. I, Dan, I think it was extremely informative and we appreciate you doing this for us. Absolutely. Um, we're catching up from all the talks we had to cancel from the hurricane. So uh, you're my last one. So now I'm caught up. Good, good. Okay, thanks everybody. Appreciate Take care, your time. Everybody.